Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover. And right now, we're continuing on with our Republic of China campaign, in which we need to talk about schooling. We cannot be content with a simple expansion of the public schools. Our children, China's children, deserve more. Our children deserve more than dusty textbooks on broken bookshelves. They deserve more than a teacher with no more education than them. Scientific equipment is a rarity, required reading from editions sometimes decades old. For a government that is supposedly so focused on education, our schools are terribly underfunded. At both provincial and national levels, Gao has vowed to increase the funding and has penned an expansive list of reforms for education. Further, Gao has toyed with the idea of a core of essential subjects for each student to be mastered by a certain age. No child will be left behind. Oh boy. Each one will be at the center of the greatest educational reform in history, for if we do not reform it, we are bound to fall back. The annals of history are not defined by the ill-educated after all. They are defined by those learning the newest ideas, and the most complex mathematics, the most <clears throat> elegant poetry. We should not judge a book by its cover, and we're currently doing scholarships for the poor. Now, there was one comment from yesterday saying that when Japan gets a rework, apparently the devs will pla are planning on adding focus trees for Thailand as well as Vietnam. Actually, Thailand would be a lot of be pretty cool to play actually because they always have a few national events that you can read about so but currently they're uh they have a growing japanese minority huh as well as burmese refugees which makes sense and thailand for the thai kind of cool and of course we saw vietnam yesterday which is very cool but ho chi minh isn't going to be lasting too long here probably anymore but up next we shall go ahead and do what for our next focus alternative higher education mm, we could do that a second look it would seem that the governors have derided our government for the fact that they are simply that they simply are not doing enough to ensure the prosperity of all Chinese. They argue that the city cannot be a meritocracy if poverty in itself will attract poverty. Zhang Wu has decided to alleviate this by attempting not only to end the lack of education for the impoverished, by incentivizing the impoverished to be educated, to the end of the very nightmarish specter that haunts them and the noises and abuses of the slums of the city. A wise choice. We could go with high standards. That's not bad. More construction speed would be very nice. Even more construction speed. Ooh, competing with the Japanese. More political power, too. Ooh, illiterate population. But poverty will get better, so we do want to go down that way. Alternative higher education. Not only must we provide state universities for excelling in fields of study, but private institutions must as well. Most, if not all, of the well-known universities in the world are private institutions, built off of the drive to learn. If we encourage this attitude of competition and thirst for knowledge, we will reap unimaginable benefits. Very good. And what things can we do here currently? Let's see. The old guard doesn't like us too much, but the reformist faction really does. Um, educating the country is really good. Nice. Mm, research speed. How are we doing with our construction speed currently? So, one, two, three, almost four. I think that's really good already. Uh, I want to get more political power and stability would be really good. Production cap is okay. Not really needed for the rest of this campaign, probably. But construction speed is not very much, but that's barely any PP. Let's go with construction speed. Nice. So we're roughly four full factory lines. We've got some improved anti-air, which is okay. Improved anti-tank. Looks like we will have to make some of this as well, but it is what it is. How's the budget doing? Minus 12 billion. Wow. Oh, it's so nice. And actually, uh, what happened to the education thing? Where'd it go? <clears throat> well, anyways... Uh, Wuhan Military Industrial Complex. Well, we can do that, but... Oh, there goes Military Austerity. Nope. Ah, uh, let's go into the next one, too. High Standards. Oh, we need all three of these. We need Chinese Scholarship as well. Oh. Oh, we need... Oh, we can do this one anyways. Cool. I like this one. Literate Population. We're no longer plagued by absolute deficiency that mass illiteracy brought to us. While our literacy rates are still below those of the leading powers, we are still getting closer and closer each day, and soon every citizen of our state will be able to read and write. More, way more construction speed, cap, efficiency... Result in improvement of our poverty rate over time. GP will receive a small boost, and our poverty rate will begin to improve the leap. After so much hard work, our bureaucrats finally compile the data. The demand for a private university is finally sufficient. For the longest time, China's best and brightest would opt out of studying domestically, attend the, the private universities of our adversaries instead. We've now taken the best from our enemies and applied it to our situation. The creators of knowledge are rarely found in public universities. At the private level, our peoples will enjoy more specialized education, propelling them to not just the factories, but to occupations which could make groundbreaking innovations that will, once again, turn China into the center of academia once again, the literacy reform census. As part of the new census, every school administrator is to report annually to Nanjing with detailed statistics of the impact literacy reform has had on their area. There's no more room for error or corruption. For too long, government funds would disappear into thin air, wasted on worthless programs or pocketed directly by kleptocrats. 
the Census Committee has been given wide-reaching authority over our schools to ensure Chinese education. First and foremost, China must read. Already, census takers are being trained to walk from school to school and effectively take notes exactly how the reforms are being executed locally and which teachers and administrators will are performing better than others. And now we wait. Now, I do want to do high standards because that's really good to get. Uh, especially with competing with the Japanese, so breakthrough in the sciences. Our continued push for reform on the scientific curriculum has led us to an educated and mature intelligentsia. New grants, funding, and scholarships will encourage momentum, monumental advances in research. Without science, there will be no modern China, and we do have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm as we're reaping the benefits of educating our populace. That's really weird. What, what happened to the whole education thing? We just got another level, but I guess that's it for us? Hmm. That's still not too bad. Factory output and division organization does go down. But way more construction speed. I've got to go that way. And I'll do this one next. 60. We're going to do this one next. Increase industrial R&D. Because we, we haven't done that one yet. These two are okay. They have the same effect. Except one costs more money and political power. Which I'm not sure why it does that. So invest in private businesses. We could try that eventually. But R&D funding is the way to go for now. 6%. Screw it. Cut down the budget just a little bit. Just a little bit. Not too much. 1, 2, 3. Almost 4. We're almost 4. Oh, so good. Hopefully we can get maybe another level of poverty improved by the end of this campaign, but it looks like probably not. But you never know. But you never know. Even academic base is going up too, but the doctrine of nationalism. In a dark alleyway of Wuhan, a woman reached out for the matches on her nightstand. <clears throat> Lighting the candle, throwing away the burnt matches, the room was filled, lit with a warm orange light. Her room smelled of wood and dumplings. In the corner of the apartment, a wood-burning stove kept her warm and fended off the wind of a winter evening. She pulled out her book, The Adapted Writings of Dr. Sun Yat-sen. The government had been promoting memoirs as a tool of propaganda and to encourage literacy. Now, to read meant to hear the words of the great forerunner of the Chinese republicanism, not just to read signs and sappy romance. Currently, she was reading an annotated version of Sun Yat-sen's comments on Pan-Asianism. His words, four years old, still rung true. A particular line struck her. The Kuomintang doctrine of nationalism has two implications. The first is the emancipation of the Chinese people, and the second is the equality of all races within China. Something stirred within her. She wasn't exactly sure how to explain it. A passion for one's nation? An excitement for something great among her people? Never had she felt something like this before, certainly not before she had learned to read. Pride for what China had gone through and was yet to achieve rushed through her. For a fleeting moment, she knew definitively, China will prevail. Cool. And let's get some more tech going. 0.74 every day, not too bad. All we need is a lot of money, and this will get looking pretty good for us. So when removed... Then that stuff will increase quite a bit, which is awesome. So I guess we're done with education? What do national spirits say? Uh, let's go and read about Chinese scholarship first. We've gained a reputation within the sphere for the intellectual capabilities of our students and on the intellectual rigors of our schools. No longer do we need borrowed Japanese <clears throat> labor for teaching our people, but rather we are completely self-sufficient, to the point where those that study under the schooling system are now applying to work in these very schools. Great. Uh, national spirits. Breakthrough in the sciences. Look at that. But that's a focus. Not a that spirit. Hmm. Breakthroughs in sciences. Our science programs have paid off. And our population is not just becoming exemplary at the studies, but also researching and discovering new concepts that can be surely used domestically and militaristically. We welcome these revolutions with open arms. So quantum mechanics aren't just a waste of time now? Probably not. And then, of course, Chinese scholarships. And then we will probably go and do competing with the Japanese. Our education efforts have paid off to such a point that our studentry and intellectuals are at a quality as high as if not higher than the, that of the Japanese intellectuals and teachers that we once had to borrow. Great. Great. And we're almost done with our land auction too, which is very boy knows too. 1.3 billion in reserves. 1, 2, 3. We've got four full factories, full lines going, and plus one, which is awesome, awesome, awesome. We can bribe the old guard, but no, we're okay. We still have the small army. We have the Defang Tiger, which we probably hopefully improve ourselves eventually. We have the State of Modern Education, so it hurts our cap and construction speed, but overall not too bad. Insubordination, which we got last time after we won the war. Energy for the Sphere. We gain an additional quarter, three quarters of a billion money. Manning the factories. Uh, what else do we have here? We have Streamlined Resource Exploitation. We have Japan's Breadbasket. We also have Made in China. Nice. And we're still slaves to the Samurai, which kind of sucks. And there goes Scotland and, and England. Legislative one factions, all right. Chinese education status is looking pretty good. And research capabilities, not too bad, but the Chinese scholarship. At long last, we have graduated from Japanese tutelage. Our academic reputation within the sphere is advanced by leaps and bounds yesterday. We were seen as idiots, good only for growing rice today. We draw the envy of all of the sphere nations for the intellectual capabilities of our students, the rigorous intensity of our schools, and our tireless devotion towards the accumulation of knowledge. We no longer require borrowed Japanese labor to educate our people. In fact, one day they will need 
us. We have achieved intellectual self-sufficiency. Our students learn to teach the next generation. Our horizon, like our knowledge, is boundless. The great liberation is that of the mind. Very cool. And actually stamp out, invest in charity subsidies, companies, invest in private businesses. Oh, ooh, this one is civvy, civvy, civvies, millies. Meh, all that stuff is okay. It is still 68. Not too bad, not too bad. And let's improve our anti-tank. I wish we could improve our military here, but eh, it is what it is. I'm going to be bad to invite these guys. You get more construction speed. Uh, GDP growth. Mm, encourage domestic consumption. We might do that one, maybe. I like the GDP growth, but it really doesn't matter too much. <clears throat> this one might, wouldn't be too bad either. Some of these are a little better, though. Uh, let's see. You hurt, hurt us by 3%. It's only 3%. Increase GDP growth by 0.3%. That's a lot of PP. I might want to save that. Resource shipments? Ooh, that's not too bad. You know what? Increase Japanese influence and faction opinion. Uh, I don't know, we're already 50% here. Military austerity? Nope, not here. Competing with the Japanese. Lori Takumi was doing homework when the postman drove by, no matter how broken his Japanese was, or how broken Japan was. At least the mail came every day. Hearing the mail drop through the slot in the door, he got excited. Maybe some of his college applications had finally come. Sorting through the bills by state-owned corporations, the nationalistic propaganda. For a return, college applications. Holding the letters is key to this freedom. He opened the first for Kyle University. He might not have been his first choice, but it was located in a big city. And no doubt was a good pick. Mori was only a little disappointed to find out he had not been accepted. Opening the other two from the Japanese universities, Komazawa University and the University of Tokyo, he was again disappointed to find out his rejection. The last letter set left to open was from the University of Nanjing. He had read in the news how well the Chinese education system was booming. Reports made it seem like the Japanese were a bit jealous over the new Chinese universities. Mori had decided to apply to the University of Nanjing, being the most prestigious of the universities in China. He had not expected to get in, surely. They were only letting in Chinese students, who were going to be ab above and beyond. To surprise, he opened the letter to find out that he was going to Nanjing. At least he knew he was go this was going to be an adventure. If not, then a good education. High standards? Pretty good to get. Scholarly population? I want more PP, but even at this point, it doesn't matter too much. I'll do high standards for more construction speed. It'll be a waste of resources to constantly crack the whip at students with such a centralized state as ours. We must encourage a culture of ed educational high standards in the household and in the classroom to make sure that students' work ethic is stronger than steel. Followed up with scholarly population. The education and curriculum reforms have brought to us a population who embody the European ideal of a Renaissance man who, one, who has learned in all fields of study, from the arts to the hard sciences and the mathematics. We have involved the matter of years from a society that was plagued by an illiterate population to one in which are 50, mil 50 men and women lining up for any job, whether it be from in machinery or professional intellectual endeavors. Pretty good, not bad. And our debt is not too bad. It could be a lot, lot worse. We're going to keep spending, though. Ooh, that's not that's getting slightly worse, but that's okay, just because we have all those reforms. And we're still making more civvies, though. So. That's the most important thing right now. Super, super important. Uh, oh, we have another one here. Modernization awareness campaigns. Increase performance of pa faction opinion of us even more. Improve academic base research facilities. So one of these will improve... Or agriculture? That's not bad. Performance in the cabinet. Um, Domestic consumption is not bad. I like that one because you get more growth. But with um, modernization awareness campaigns, you lose 400 million in... Additional expenses. Ooh, it's not good. You don't get any more GDP growth, which kind of sucks, but... Ah, uh, go and spend it. Why not? Performance of the cabinets. It's not really worth it. 50. Yeah, these two. Let's let's just mark these guys off. Develop military industry. Don't really care about that. Once this, we're probably not going to go to war anyways. Um, invest in private businesses. That's not bad. Yeah, we'll still probably do that one, and we can close that one up too. Cool. And commission geological survey. Sure. And exploit Jinan materials. Jinan has a very specific material we need of. Aluminum. The region is practically overflowing with the mineral as prime subject for upstart mining companies. Why not? The application. Gao Zongwu himself had ordered that only the best teachers be hired for each and every job. While the meaning of this order was up to interpretation, Tian Zhu Fang had decided it meant that every application to become a teacher should be thoroughly read through and judged. For the entire province of Henan, Tian and his lazy co-workers sorted through applications for prospective teachers. Some group in wealthy Nanjing and Shanghai neighborhoods to nationalistic parents and decided they were destined to help down and under in the West. Some group as peasants found Jesus, became illiterate, and naturally walked into education. Whether rich or poor, religious or not, Tian was indiscriminate. He judged by experience and by, com by compatibility with the job. While his co-worker usually just scanned the paper and signed the authorita authorization, Tian looked at each one with a scrutiny that was probably appropriate. 
Inappropriate, at least. In the name of Prophet's nature, the man worked overtime almost every single day. Nights. A poring over applications meant that he'd return home in the wee hours of the morning, with sore eyes and a sense of upholding the security of his nation. His wife complained that he was never around and always wondered if Tian was secretly a giant Japanese agent, off doing work in the bars and galas of Zhang Zhu. In truth, Tian Z Zhu Fang was just a minor bureaucrat doing great things on the one brisk morning, Tuesday morning. Tian woke up early to get to work. Putting on his cheap jacket and slipping his wire glasses on, he pushed open the door, jumped on his flying pigeon, and rode to his job. Walking in with a smile and a passion to serve his nation, his boss handed a paper upon his entry. Was Tian finally being rewarded for his national service? Unfolding the paper, he realized he was being fired. For the reason given, his boss wrote, Terminate for being overcautious. Huh. Wow. That kind of sucks, man. You do so well, and then you get fired for that? That, that really sucks. That really sucks. Um, I guess armor, maybe? We do have APCs, but that's already pretty good. I'll grab some of those, I guess. Make our APCs even better, then. Ooh, one, two, three, four, some. Four, almost four and a half, which is great. Cool, not bad. And then the uh, population and competing with the world. Our efforts have appeared to go beyond even our imaginations could take them. Intellectuals from our country are competing with the foremost greatest minds of the world, where the universities and schools being renowned and sought after internationally. Nice. More war sports stability. And then... Education fully modernized, which I want to get as fast as possible so we can reduce the effects of Slave of the Samurai as well as get another research slot. We could have done it on the right side, but I focused on the left side because we already did a lot of stuff. Oh, wait, where did you do? Oh, my bad. We already did it on the right side. Ha ha ha. I didn't realize that. I forgot about that. My bad. But that's okay. That's totally okay. Ah, oh, beautiful. Go, 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 go. Build, build, build. 7.2%. Not enough. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. It's almost 69.2. And let's compete with the world. John Ching's book was a massive success, which was a surprise considering it was a, a dull collection of writings on the history of cultural and scientific exchanges between China and Japan in antiquity. While there was some censorship by the Japanese, the dual nation still remained as relatively inaccessible as it, had, as it is. He suspected the critics were at least or at the heart of why his bucket skyrocketed in popularity. They planned his book as some kind of great revival of academia in China. The common man and woman had picked it up to show off their worldliness, or simply to educate themselves. Never before in Chinese history had a non-fiction book become so popular in such a short amount of time. It's not like Qian's writing it was, uh, was that amazing. He was fine at best. His best guess at its success was how both the Japanese and Chinese had seized onto it as a propaganda tool, and how its release coincided with the aftershocks of Chinese educational reform. In any case, Qian, or Qian, while sitting on a small pile of cash. And that... And with that, he was happy, and then education fully modernized. Our curriculum steps. Toe to toe in repertoire, depth, and breadth when compared to that of education standards in Japan, Germany, and the US. We will continue on the path to innovation, but for the time being, our job here is done. Beautiful. Absolutely great, my friends. Absolutely great. Up next, invest in Chinese companies. That'd probably be really good to do. Um. You lose half a billion in liquid reserves, you get more GDP growth, which is good. You get more cap and output, which is okay. And your GDP will, will probably increase. Hopefully the growth will increase, and you might get a city or two, but that's not too bad. And the old guy really doesn't like us. But the influence here is really good still, so that's actually really nice. Eh, that's okay. Sabotage the Japanese. Oh, that's not bad. We don't want to increase their... Well, decreasing their influence might not be actually bad. But 10%. Uh, Cool. Competing with the world. Ping glanced at his blueprints. They had been stolen from German factories and smuggled over to the sphere by some Kenpai Tai agent, until they were finally handed over to the Chinese with a heavy price uh, attached, of course. It was typical of German design, an impractical size, easily targeted by bombers, a company with massive fuel costs meant that it would be barely functioning in battle. A couple of heavy mines and a piercing tank bullet would, could take one of these down in no time. Ping's munitions workshop was perfectly suited to build a mine that would, could target the soft underbelly of the tank. His workshop, flooded with qualified applications for people who wanted to assist the burgeoning military industrial complex in China, was not only challenging J Japanese designs, but challenging designs cooked up by some of the greatest arms manufacturers in Berlin and Washington. With the assistance of Japanese intelligence, China was about to copy as well as counter technology created by those outside of the sphere. Outside of the obvious military benefit, it meant that factories once producing consumer goods had begun to switch to production of ammo, guns, and even limited batches of tanks. The business of war was booming, and Ping was in perfect place to capitalize on it, thanks to nothing before the Chinese mind. And so then we're done with two-thirds of the focus tree, and which will go with new tools. The great theoretical and technical advancements produced throughout the industrialization effort now influence the most basic elements of industrial labor. Battery-operated power tools, digital sensors, and refined hydraulics are among the plethora of soon-to-be-deployed equipment resulting from our research. Very delightful. Very, very good. And Bennett got elected again. Wow. Because I know everyone loves Bennett. There's not a soul who does not love him. Mm, I kind of want to do this one up here. 
Yeah, I'll try that one out. It's going to hurt the consumer goods just a little bit. So now we're down to what? Wow, minus 9.3 billion? That's not good. But it is what it is. One, two, three, four, five. Wow, we're on the sixth one already? Beautiful, my friends. Absolutely beautiful. Light interior, exterior stuff. Cool. Why not? Oh, but that was minus 6 billion. Why is he going up and down? Oh. Yeah, it is what it is. Beautiful. New Chinese companies. That'd be good. Even though we're done with all the technology, like, we're already done with this. So, not too bad. Modern radar stations, decryption machines, maximize efficiency. That'd be pretty good to do. Societal expertise will rapidly increase, so. But we gotta do new Chinese technicians after we do new tools. Cool. And which? New Chinese technicians. But, but first, of course, technology. 4 3 slot. Oh, it's so nice. Wow, we're modern. We're almost modernized. New Chinese technicians. None can say that the efforts of our technicians have not been valiant. But now more than a few of them spend more time reminiscing about the good old days than actually working. The time has come for new blood to take center stage, and with the aid of a new few hastily translated textbooks, we can just achieve that. Nice. Seven and a half billion. Go and cut down some more debt. We could invest in our in our uh, GDP, but man, we're kind of okay. Uh, nothing about the old garden c cutting down on corruption. But that sucks, but that's okay. New tools. So, Gao Zongwu is a fascist. Despotist is led by him. As well as authoritarian democracy. Conservative democracy is led by Deng Ma. Reformist liberal democracy is led by Liao Feng. And social democracy is led by Ma Wu. Ma Wu 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 Min. Cool. And the final step towards self-reliance. In Hang Yan, a new construction crane taller and stronger than any other available in the prosperity co-prosperity sphere, has recently begun work in a new skyscraper. In Hubei, a new water-resistant construction machine that were developed to aid the construction of the Yangtze River Dam are being put to use in, in a number of other aquatic infrastructure projects. In the factories of Nanjing, a new automated crane arm capable of lifting extremely heavy objects or pr products directly off assembly lines and placing them into packaging crates has become the newest status symbol among the city's industrialists. As China continues to industrialize at exponential rate. Our engineers have begun to design their own tools to suit their needs. While Japanese tools are still in widely use, they are the growing consensus that Chinese tools are not only cheaper and easier to obtain, but also more versatile and require less maintenance. Someone argued that a hammer is a hammer, a wrench is a wrench, and a bulldozer is a bulldozer. Those unfortunate souls have clearly never had the opportunity to work with the tools bearing the Chinese stamp of quality, made in China. A craftsman is only as good as his tools, and we have the best and support innovation. For a few months now, a single word has been buzzing through the universities and technical schools of China. Innovation. As near as anyone can tell, this word merely refers to the same process of scientific advancement that we've always done, but it seemingly has accompanied a new resurgence of interest in academia and industry. We get more fact, uh, reformers' faction opinion, a debt will go up a little bit more, and our GDP will receive a boost, which is pretty good. Ah, very, very nice. So yeah, I, I will... I'm very interested in seeing what the devs have cooked up for China whenever TNO2 comes out or whenever we get an update for this. So I'm really interested in seeing what they can do. But I just realized that we get over one political power every single day. Wow. China is almost modernized. Oh, it's so nice. That's so good. Just warms your heart a little bit. Hey, that's looking a little better too. Used to be 6 billion, but now it's even better. The first citizens of the modern China. Ten months ago, Li Ji was a recently unemployed man who had spent his entire life in an ammo factory and was looking for new opportunities. Six months ago, he successfully rebuilt his first generator. Today is his first day as a repairman at an apartment complex that recently installed electric lighting and heating. With the help of Japanese instructors and not an insignificant amount of learning by trial and error. <clears throat> The first class of Chinese technicians is starting to show real promise. Already, we're relying less on the Japanese to install and repair new devices for us. Instruction manuals printed in Mandarin are beginning to replace those printed in Japanese. Our foreign guides seem surprised, and even a little dismayed at how quickly their students are progressing. Steps are being taken to further integrate these newly minted technology or technological specialists into our modernization program, as well as into the burgeoning Chinese electronic manufacturing sector. Long considered an impossible dream, the idea of a modern, self-sufficient China seems more attainable within each passing day. We should no longer rely upon Japan for progress and we're just going to go do this ahead of time because we want to get more max factories in the state and just build cities faster 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 oh we have technology no oh we're pretty good on technology exploit fujian minerals fujian does not only house the minerals we need under its rocky terrain they're also minerals found exclusively in china nangpingite and chuliite cool no, we don't have enough money for that probably but that's okay um sabotage these guys i don't mind maybe getting more cities right now let's see if we can do that one decrease uh, factory opinion let's do that one real quick that's going to hurt them. A little more influence. We have 52% here anyway, so I don't really care about that too much. 
encourage domestic consumption. Um, the Hearst of Consumer Goods, no. Just no. Cool. And support innovation would be nice. We need more liquid reserves, of course, but, you know, it is what it is. Almost 2 billion manpower, too. Geological survey? Why not? Minus 8.6 billion? Pretty good. And after that, adapt computer technology? Actually, you know what? Let's do that one, just because it's almost 1970, and we can get more research speed with the next tech. Now, all the glowing screens of computers line the offices of all major departments of the state and industry. We can take them back to the factory floor. We can modify the format and internal syntax of the keyboards to be more suited to Chinese characters rather than Japanese, and reverse engineer them to produce cheaper models specialized in their specific function. And before we forget, let's go over here. And England defeats... Wow, that's actually a long time for England to defeat Scotland. That took a lot longer than I thought it would. But, while our training schools have helped create the first generation of Chinese technicians, it's not enough. As China's industry continues to modernize and expand, the demand for skilled laborers will increase until the government will be unable to afford all to educate all the workers our economy requires. This has become a problem much sooner than we anticipated, as already more of our citizens are applying to the training programs than we can make room to teach. To avoid creating an educational bottleneck, it has been proposed that creation of te technical education programs at Chinese universities. Uh, oh no, we propose that instead of training all the workforce, we subsidize the creation of technical education programs at Chinese universities and businesses, as well as fund the research and development of new technologies by them by these students. In return for this aid, our government will receive significant discounts on any potential products our students may recreate, as well as access to all research products that is produced by them. Recent, regardless of what these bright minds end up creating, we will learn much valuable information and will help create the skilled labor force we have lacked for so long. The Chinese government has always supported entrepreneurship. And I do apologize once again for my mispronunciations because I like talking fast. That's just kind of the thing I do. But new Chinese companies. The Zaibatsu exploitation of China's had effectively made Japanese industry the only business that could survive in China until recently. We've had no hope of countering the dominance, left only with locally owned restaurants and dingy bars. This is no longer the case now that we have assembled a proper industrial conglomerate to assert our dominance to create a Chinese economy built off Nanjing business, not Tokyo's. The technological research would be good to get too, so... I mean, all these are good to get, so we'll do the best we can. Uh, 3%. Uh, how's that doing for us right now? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, more than 5.5, so it's really good. Um, oh, yes. Keep doing that one, too. So now that puts us at what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. More than 5.5, which is good. Cracking the code. Well, a few Chinese de design comp computers have been released. They've not been highly successful. Most have been incredibly slow. Several have been created and number of safety hazards for their operators, and all of them are barely functional. Everyone from the president of the Republican government down to the first year students at our technical universities knows that only acceptable computer is a Japanese computer. A group of computer technicians have recently approached our patent office with a design that may change this. Early tests of this machine, dubbed the JJ Mark II, shows that it is not only much less likely to catch fire than the JJ Mark I, but that it is much faster and more powerful power efficient than its predecessors, potentially even on par with Japanese designs. If we fund the designers of the JJ Mark II and other inventors that develop similarly advanced computers, we could jumpstart the Chinese computer industry and begin the process of overtaking the Japanese in the area they felt their superiority was most secure. The crooks won't be expecting this slap in the face. Followed up with communication tech. The good key to good management is good communication. We, as such, we can promote efficiency by providing robust, modern means of communication. Phone lines running to every factory, radios in every delivery truck, call centers in every city. Nice. And civil war erupts in Yemen? Oh, boy. Hopefully the oil crisis really doesn't hurt us too much. But you never know. Oh, boy. That's not good to have. Mm. I don't want to lose PP yet. Uh, how is this? I don't mind inviting Japanese companies. Uh, let's go ahead, maybe instead... Uh, Japanese. Uh, well, do we already do the thing that gives us less consumer goods? We probably already did. Cut. How about over here? Is there anything else here? Limit their influence. Uh, no, that would be very good. Support old guard interests. No. And these guys in the cabinet. Um, you lose pee pee. That's not really good. Performance in the cabinet. I mean, that doesn't really matter to us too much. Instruction Oman. We don't really care. Domestic consumption. That really hurts us though. Yeah, I don't really want to do that one. Yeah, these, these are just okay. This one, it's only 3%, and you get 0.3% more growth, so we'll do that one. Let's hope we can wait. Cool. A grand opening. Yesterday, a new store opened in Wucheng. The freshly painted sign above the door led Lee's Electronic Goods and Repair. Inside, the shelves are filled with new radios, hot plates, record players, cameras, and even a few TVs. Lee's business is off to a good start, but it will not be long until he faces competition, as stores like his are popping up all across the country. As more and more technology is manufactured in China, more and more businesses are emerging to sell these new marvels to the eager Chinese populace. However, these new stores are not local branches of some far-off corporation based in Tokyo or Hiroshima. 
They are, by and large, wholly owned and operated by Chinese citizens cashing in on this growing market. Reports have reached us that some of the particularly successful companies have even begun hiring Chinese technicians to design new competing products to reduce reliance on Japanese suppliers. At long last, our investments have paid off and the Chinese technology is turning a profit. A modern economy is within our grasp. Great, great, great. And we should have the blueprint down here. Yes, we do. Just go ahead and do that. Awesome. Yeah, we're rapidly becoming more and more independent, which is great. And which next, do we need uh, communication tech? Oh, year one report. Oh, look at this. Uh, I want to read about better computers, maybe. Mm, I do want to get down here quickly. But how about the futures now? That's also very good to do. So we go to here. Requires all three of these. So, modern radar stations. If the wars of the last three decades have taught us anything, is that our air power is key. Given that, it is imperative that we take measures to ensure we are not blind to the skies. Large-scale radar stations at key points on the mainland and coast would serve this purpose. Naturally, such facilities are only needed to aid commercial air traffic in year one report. The first annual literacy census reports that 98% of students pass the first nationwide literacy benchmark. Though by no means a difficult test, these results slight signify the success of government literacy programs. The literacy rate among the youth has increased far more rapidly than expected by even the most optimistic bureaucrats. The dream of universal literacy seems less of a dream and more like a reality with each passing day. A long journey remains, of course, until China can boast a literacy rate similar to that of Japan or America, but the foundation for the future has been laid. All that remains is to build a top at great progress and arrival. Lee gazed through the narrow streets before him, struggling to recall a city which he had called his childhood home. Gobbled streets and wooden walls danced between, behind his eyes, but it all slipped through his mind like a sea. Hazy like so many other memories of his forgotten childhood, but now he was back, a, back in Beijing, worlds apart from the slippy rural village his mother had fled with him too. Ancient wooden structures and stones carved by years of use still surrounded Lee, but here and there he could spot a tower of glass and steel, the first children of a new China and gateway to a new life for Lee and his family. Lee marched on, grasping onto his youngest son's hand so that the flowing mass of people would not sweep him away. The family stayed close together, Lee's wife, his three children, and ancient grandfather all struck by the size and pace of the city, beset by a thousand vendors and shoved by a thousand more migrants just like themselves. It was the first time any of them could remember any city larger than a market town. The new homes overawed them. But that, it was so much so much opportunity to leave. His sons would not suffer the same humiliation as him, and his family would not be tied down in the rural backwater which the government was already leaving behind. No, here in Beijing. Li would set a new path. Here, he would not break his back over a plow. He would rise. Here, his sons would become the new men of the new China. The only question was where to start. The Li family had not come to a new world empty-handed. The children carried pens and spoons. Li's wife carried food. Li himself had a great metal plate and whatever else he could fit on his back. Where there were people, there's hunger. And where there's hunger, there's money. They marched on blending into the press of the booming city, where rich and poor pushed through on cars, trolleys, donkeys, and on foot. Li took one moment to look back at his entourage and call out, Welcome to Beijing, our new home. Awesome. Man, what could have China been if they not fallen to communists? Man, what could have it been? Hey, 7.8% so it's not too bad. Uh, let's do this one more time, why not? Cut down to the deck, because I want our growth to go even faster, but we're done with our land auction. Great. I'll uh, go do that anyways. More resources is pretty good to do, especially for rubber. We actually can get some more rubber. And modern radar stations would be good, and we can invite Japanese companies, which actually might not be a bad thing to do for more consumer goods right now. Uh, expertise does increase. Oh, uh, you know what? We can do that once. Why not? Does it help our... Yeah, oh, it does. Equipment. Expertise, not bad. And modern radar stations, because we're making so much people anyways. We have 73% stability, 50% war support. China is just doing so well right now. And happy August. Happy August, everyone. Nanjing calling. Or we're setting up shop first. Grandfather, stay with Yong. Oh, Yong. Neither of you can continue on like this. I said I would help you in the city, Lee. Are you telling me to lie to you and go back on my word? No. In the dim electric light of their ramshackle home, Lee gazed at the sleeping bodies of his family, tangled up in each other's arms on the ground. Beijing had not been kind to them, and trying to adjust the life as a street vendor had taken its toll on his body and soul. Lee was no stranger to hard work, nor was his family. Forcing a living out of the Chinese land had given all but the youngest hands of iron. But even so, Beijing had punished them for their naivety, and none more so than Lee's ancient grandfather. The old man's legs were twitching, he had started to cough, and there were sours on his arms which refused to heal. His body which had survived, who knew how many years, was breaking down, even if his stubbornness was alive and well. You must stay here, father. I did not come here to kill you. What about your granddaughter, the kids? You think they want to see you? What about them? I was here when the emperor died. You think I'm just going to fall to this? Stop this insolence. I'm still able to walk. You just make sure that you do your part as well. And so another day came and went, and the red sun slowly setting over Beijing. Li could not help but wonder if he had made a terrible mistake. He had sold everything to get here. What little of worth he was 
he had was now far away or melted down, also that he may let have his chance. Grandfather slowly turned away and into the room's one small chair, freeing Lee's gaze to fall once more on his wife and children huddling together. Exhausted and forlorn, Lee nonetheless felt a smile tug at his face. Three sons and a wife. Mother had been so happy when she heard the news. Wrapping his arms around them, Lee finally succumbed to sleep. Lo another long and tiring day gone by. Do it for them. Nodging calling. We still have some resistance here, too. Oh, that's not good. Oh, and some anti air. That makes sense. All across China, from Nanjing, uh, from Beijing to Hunan. Night after night, people are turning into the radios to hear the news of China and the world. Our people have the choice of listening to the local stations or the nationwide broadcast of the large news agencies in Nanjing or even a few select privately owned stations, mostly owned by Japanese companies. Though the majority of our people remain illiterate, radio news stations have made it possible for them to be just as informed on current affairs as an educated newspaper reader. Radio broadcasts have also made coordinating our efforts and inspiring civilian support for the five modernizations much easier, as the reach of public announcements is no longer limited to city centers and government offices. Potentially even more exciting than the rise of radio, a team of computer engineers in Jinan successfully transmitted a short message wirelessly over a computer network to a second computer almost 300 kilometers away in Jinan. While this technology is still in its earliest stages, it promises to change how we communicate forever. Rapid communication will be key to defeating the Japanese, followed up with better computers, which would be great. We have resources and technical knowledge to undertake a second revision of our standard computing systems. Moving away from previous methods of specialization, we can create standardized systems with consistent modular parts. This would allow just a few models to adequately perform in almost every environment and task. Oh, beautiful. The Anti-Corruption Industrial Subcommittee. The sky was choked with smoke. Bicycles bumbled along the street. Occasionally, a motor vehicle would peek its head along the thousands of bikes and men walking the streets. While not calm, all was normal. The government was modernizing at a steady pace. We interview Zong Yuhan, a bureaucrat. This must be the first time I've told my story, huh? Well, here it goes. I had just joined a new subcommittee, the Anti-Corruption Industrial Subcommittee. It was an entry-level job, especially considering we did nothing but placate the reformists. We'd walk into a factory and make sure all the workers were happy. They'd always happen to be, coincidentally, check some fake bank papers and leave. Japanese influence was given, especially considering 99% of every factory in the nation was Japanese owned. We were at a newly opened one called the Wang Jai Wing or Jingwei State Factory, if I recall correctly. Another routine job, another mediocre paycheck, another day with my painfully boring co-workers. We said hello to the factory overseer, a young Japanese man thoroughly entrenched in the old money of the Zaibatsus, looking over some smiling laborers, skimmed tax papers like normal. I grabbed the papers I needed to, got lunch on the way back, and looked through the folders. In my infinite wisdom, I realized I'd taken the wrong folder, but... Just to get back, no big deal. But a reason nobody would care if I just took a glance. You know, if there was anything of importance in there... One, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, we're working on seven. Nice. And almost minus 10 billion. Pretty good. And we'll do better computers very, very soon. And we're doing really well. We have 122 civilian factories. Wow. The revelation. Um, oh, boy. My apologies about that, but the revelation. The dozens of papers were the kind of thing that lawyers dreamed of over the 76 pages, every single wrong that anyone with a remote relation to the Zaibatsu committed. The future plans to continue these wrongs. They started quite simple, the businessmen buying off factories for cheaper than they were worth with implications of threats. The actions quickly ramped, ramped up, ranging from activity encouraging opium to use to increase reliance on Japanese deriving the threatening leading government officials to pass laws with millions of yuan. Worse still, Japanese businessmen have been taking advantage of those close economic relations within the sphere to make monopolization easier. Consolidating mergers across boards was easier when borders barely played a role. What had been once a piece of ice floating out in the ocean had been revealed to be the biggest iceberg in the entire world. As time and ink went on, the counts got more and more egregious. Stated matter-factly on paper was support for the use of slave labor in areas subject to less surveillance. Using money or worse threats to cover up the rape of women laborers were frequent matters that the Japanese dealt with. And of course, who could forget about child labor? The most revolting part, Zong noticed, was how deeply unemotional the paper was. It was simply a ledger of crimes, nothing more. Zong let out a deep sigh. He then proceeded to walk to the nearest bathroom and vomit. Why did it have to be him that stumbled on this pile worth the crap? A new crisis tree will be unlocked to deal with this issue. Oh, crud. That's not good. Ooh, let's at least finish the modern radio stations first, please. We got, oh, we have eight, oh, wow, we have literally eight days. Let's wait first. Let's wait, 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 wait. We might need some PP, so let's save our PP for now. As much as, I, oh, this one's really good. Let's go, we'll do that one first. Ooh, that's not good. That's really not good. We have only 80 million. Oh, uh, this is not good. Get bonus radar. Eyes on the sky. Before the five modernizations began, the most advanced electronic equipment China boasted was a small network of radar stations, installed by the Japanese army between 48 and 53. The stations were intended to provide an early warning for Japan, rather than any actual protection for China. These installations weren't sufficient to cover all of China when they were built, and in the decades since then, they've become outdated and decrepit. China needed a modern air defense system, and upgrading our radar network is absolutely vital to this. Even the Japanese agree that modernizing China's radar systems will increase the protection of both sides. 
From Beijing to Xiamen, dozens of advanced outposts are being constructed at military bases and weather monitoring stations. The existing stations have been upgraded, providing a foundation for this new network that we're building soon. All the channels will be under the protective cover of a blanket radio signals projected from our state-of-the-art systems. There won't be a bird in the air between Vietnam and Manchuria that we won't know about. Damage control, all oh, crap. Uh, terrorists come upon China, but all is not yet lost. The papers that Zong Yuhan uncovered reveal the terrible secret of Japanese control, and will not do simply let these papers disappear in the passage of time. Now we must plan what to do and keep these pages out of the hands of the Paras. For they were to go public, they could be the great cause of irreversible damage, damage that would scar China for decades. Oh, crap. That's not good. That's really not good. Nice. Well then, so let them... F oh, we'll do... Let's read about... Oh, there goes Ho Chi Minh. Trouble in Nanjing next. Yeah, oh, or we'll do this one first. I realized in my stupor that I had taken a couple of options on how to deal with this. I turned it back in the businessman I took it from. Forget all this happened or try my best and live my life in eternal questioning, asking what would have happened if I had turned it in or I realized. I could take it to the, my supervisor and see what came of this pile of crap. Obviously, you know what I chose because I'm sitting right here. At the time, I thought I was, it was an idiotic move. Still not sure quite sure why I ended up turning it into the supervisor. I'd like to think it's because it weighed on my conscience, but knowing me back then, I thought I'd give him, he'd give me a bonus. Still, I was speechless when I pressed the paper, or presented the paper. Eventually, I wriggled the words out of my mouth, and in that moment, I remembered a particular thought I had. I found it darkly humorous that a paper was in our invention, yet the ink on the paper was out of a thoroughly Japanese species. My supervisor did not share this same giggling sentiment, went white as a sheet of paper, and vomited it in the bathroom just as I had done. After some time in the bathroom, he returned and asked me to schedule a meeting with the Central Committee of Industrial Safety and Trouble in Nanjing. The papers went public. Every newspaper in every town in every province is reporting as this crisis unfolds. Japanese businessmen are leaving without a word. Chinese workers despair as they read about their comrades' blight. China is falling apart and nobody can argue against it. But the people look towards Nanjing in the center. What will we do to put this to rest or at least dampen the fire? What will Gao do as he always does to stop the Nanjing crisis? Oh boy. Oh boy, that's all I can say. Just Oh boy, that's not good. Not good what's going to come. The Industrial Safety Committee. The bureaucracy was slow. Two weeks after filing for a meeting with the Industrial Safety Committee, Zong had finally gotten the news that he was, a, he was to speak with them. Both he and his supervisor would present the papers to the committee. After too many sleepless nights that Zong had found could only be called by heavy months of Jiu, he was finally going to get this over with. The committee was located in the administrative sector of the city, a mix of housing reserved for leaders and even larger administrative buildings. There was a grandiosity, grandiosity to it. The building's clean-shaven and the built men walking around the streets even more so. In one of the smaller buildings at the end of the central street was the industrial safety building. It was full of civil servants who had managed to get to a more prominent position, probably because of family ties and disgruntled former Rai KMT leaders rehabilitated under Gao. The highest-ranking official were unelected, those who ran the committee. Zong followed the signs that led to the offices of the committee number, member and nodded at the secretary, who already knew his business. Entering into his committee room, Zong found a simple open office. His supervisor was sitting on a chair against the wall with his face in his hands. A man in the middle of some of work stood up from his desk and introduced himself to Zong. Chen Xing Chung was his name. I understand. We have some important business to get to, Zong. He nodded, and Chen gave him a warm, reassuring smile. I already have the papers from your supervisor, but I thought it would be best if the whole committee went over them together. Again, Zong nodded. This time swallowed by his fear. Chen gathered the rest of his members over by a conference table. The papers were taken out. Zong explained how and when he got the papers. Finally, the committee read them. As they scanned through the document, their faces went white in the same shade that was the supervisor's had gone. Even Chen's norm normally unfazed expression was broken as the scale of the situation was revealed. Chen croaked out a couple words, we must contact the president. Let them fester. Sustainability. Exploit China leading to easy economic growth and recovery. Industrial strength comes at a cost. Uh, trusting Zaibatsu's industrial support pays off. The final steps. Oh boy. Success and progress. Japanese led reforms, increased daily political power gain, uh, sacrificing resources, jobs for Chinese, reaping the fields, guns from the rising sun. Maybe not such a bad idea. Hmm. You look like you'd use a pork bum. A man who has not eaten Zhang Bing is never full man. Why don't you have a dumpling in your ham? Lee smiled through the sweat on his face. <clears throat> He had founded a place for his business. The city was growing upwards and outwards. His eldest son, Y, remarked that it was just like him. Every day seems another inch, another pound was added. Wei, it was already 14. 
older by far than the nine-year-old Ji or the other three-year-old Yang, and he had taken to Beijing well. Almost too well, he began to talk like a native. His guide had become attuned to the booming city, picking up its pace, and even gained friends in the sons of the workers and engineers Li sold to. And what better place for his own business to grow than at the bleeding edge of Beijing, where hundreds of laborers are bust into construct factories, housing blocks, new streets, and malls? Li had not been the only street vendor to tag alongside the new wave of industrialization, but perhaps he had found the perfect spot right off the crossroads and close enough to the hundreds of hungry laborers sent to build a new China. Living on this site, they worked. A captive audience, if there ever was one. <coughs> Life was so hard, very hard. Lee, despite himself, would dream of the open and green fields, this crisp, still, air of a world waking up. The city had learned never sleep, and it felt like neither did he. Before the sun rose, Lee would leave his cramped and leaking room, stepping over the still sleeping bodies of his children. For hours he would run across the city or stand on the boiling oil of his craft, and he would not return to his rented housing until the sun had set and the night was lit up by the lights of a million souls. It occurred to him that he had never seen the stars in Beijing night sky. But still, it was life. A routine to stand by, a craft to master, and a near-perfect spot of the city in which to practice it. His wife even whispered into Lee's ear that she may be pregnant. Another son, no doubt. Yes, sir, at long last. Lee could stand on his own. Maybe I should buy hamach, uh, hachimaki. No one wants to sweat in their food. And what's a balanced approach? Balanced Chinese and Japanese interests. Appeasing the Japanese. Limited reforms. Ooh. Hiring Japanese. Rolling back corruption. Use Japanese influence. Back to normal. Tax breaks for zaibatsus. Zaibatsu returns. Oh boy, walking the tightrope. Chinese led reform. Um, corruption, corrupt businessmen leave. And so does jobs. Japanese brain drain. Oh boy. And confidence is restored. We can get status quo. Japanese reform complete. Chinese reform complete. Thorough reform. That's not too bad. But troubles in Nanjing. Oh, oh, we lose four military factories and six cities. Oh boy, oh cry. The papers have been leaked. I probably don't need to tell you that what was in those papers. I will, though. Just so you get it all down. All those rumors about Zaibatsu mistreatment of workers, about gigantic corporate consolidations across the entire sphere, about entire towns being whisked off the map, being put in some faraway labor camp, they were all true, every single one, and we've had documents for each crime, murder, fraud, assault, manslaughter, embezzlement, we have landed on the mother load of reports. You know, you gotta understand. When you're looking at the media, the newspapers, heck, the radio, that we're trying our best, all these Western standards of a press telling the honest truth, nothing but the truth, all that BS. There wasn't any truth. China was bursting with stories, not the truth. Gao Zongwu was a devil, it was the angel, the Japanese traders, Jesus. So when our, our doorstep rolls up this paper with no real authentic authentication, uh, no evidence for the claim besides a few dusty papers dating from a few decades ago. Of course we're going to print the darn paper. Jesus, you think your average guy is going to buy a story about how Wang Up North is opening a new shop? No. He's going to buy the story that screams about how the Han Yan are destroying the country, god dang it. Bad word me if I knew that my little Lu He tabloid was about to blow the biggest scandal in Chinese history was wide open. We never did learn who sent us the papers, but they turned out to be true just enough to start the whole gosh darn Japanese crash. You won't believe me on this, but we still don't know who sent the docs. Suddenly, within a day of publishing a few excerpts, we had sold every copy of the paper. Zong Yang, Rabao, and Shibao had both picked it up. Gigantic strikes immediately began in every Chinese city I could name. I'm not surprised, of course. It felt like the entire country was just falling apart at her feet. Gao Zong Wu didn't step out of his office for two days. Holy crap, two days! And the Japanese, well, they stopped squirming in those expat villages in Nanjing and jumped town. Shanghai, Manchukuo, whatever. You know all this, of course. I just still can't believe it really happened. I didn't know it then, but I, we... We're at the center of this whole thing, and it was only by the coincidence that we printed what well, what we printed was true. Not like we fact checked. Whatever true means, anyways. Oh crap. Oh! Wow! The non gene crisis begins. Our economy will take a serious blow. Some so sort of weird symbol. Why? A new crisis reveal mocked to do with the issue. Um. The crisis in non gene? Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Time to shake it up. Uh. That's not very good. The president's rude awakening. President Zong Wu's sleep schedule had been off the last couple weeks. He'd been loaded up with work as the government continued reforming. His treasured time that he got to rest was short. This is why he was deeply irritated when he received a call in the middle of a nap. Groggy and annoyed, he was almost hung up, or just hung up the phone, but mustered up the strength to pick it up and put the telephone to his ear. All that was said was that there was an urgent matter that needed to be attended to and why, and that he should be ready to, for a meeting in ten minutes. Gal groaned with the energy of a man who hadn't slept for two days, fell out of bed, and put on the first suit he saw. Probably some jumpy administrator thought he spotted something wrong in some ledgers. This wasn't worth his time, but he was already out of bed. Gal arrived at the central administrative building and got to the room, reserved for the meeting. 
The president did not expect to see every major diplomat and economic official stationed in Nanjing next to that of the former KMT member, Chen Xing Chung, an unfamiliar man in a shabby town brown suit, introduced himself as Zong. Each one looked as if though they were at a funeral. Gao wondered what the situation was. Certainly, it could not be as bad as expressions seemed to say. Chen handed him a folder that the other office officials had already read. With an explanation provided by Zhang and Chen, and the proof in the papers, Gao Zongwu, president of the National Government of China, realized that he was in deep crap. At least the papers haven't leaked yet. Oh boy. Oh, let's cancel that one first. What can we do? Um, so, we obviously have all this stuff here. We still want to go down that way. Uh, is there anything else here? No? Uh, give it, maybe, give it one day. We'll see. Now... No, new focus view? No, they, no new focus view. Well, I guess... Well, we're still going to lose four millis. And six civvies. That's so bad. How bad has the economy been hit? Uh, that's a very bad for our debt interest. And out of GDP growth. But it could be a lot worse, actually. Oh, we're losing political power. How are we losing political power? Ah, the trouble in Nanjing. That's why. Ah, that is... That is not good. Wow. Wow. That is just... Ah! Ah! Oh, crap. But we also need to smoke out the rats. Remove Japanese influence in the Chinese economy. We'll probably go that way. Industrial independence. Businesses pull out. That's going to be very painful to do this. Closing up shop. Setting up shop. De facto sanctions. Through a reform. You know, we were bustling and doing quite well. And now we're hurting ourselves a little bit. Yeah, where is that? Oh, there it is. Political mess. Holy crap. Minus 1.75. Consumer goods factors is really down. Stability is minus 10%. We're still looking not too bad, though. Competition and degradation. Li had seen bayonets duller than the eyes of the three who arrived today. Scarcely two meters from the spot Li's stall had been for the past two months in a group, new group set up shop. Young, sharp, and most of all dangerous in Li's eyes. It was early morning, and the cool mist still rolled through the streets, not yet dispelled by the tra light traffic. Li set his face to stone and allowed himself to hope that they were merely mistaken, that his apprehension was merely from his fatigue. He approached the trio as they were finishing unfolding their stand. What do you want? snapped the tallest of the two men before Li had a chance to speak. Lee stuttered out. I've been in this spot for over a month. It's my spot. Everyone knows this. The short of the two snorted. What does a peasant want in Xi? He says we're in a spot he wants us to leave. Walking up to... Walking up, the Lee, the third member of the trio, a woman said straight to his face. Well, I didn't see you here this morning. Find your own spot. Lee was shocked. He expected them to be rude, as so many city people were, but this? Lee purposefully looked away from the woman and looked back towards Xi. This is my spot. Any ask anyone, even the construction workers. What is wrong with you? Then you should have gone here a bit faster. You peasant migrants always move so slow, but that's your loss. With that, the group turned away and continued to set up their stand. Lee had no words. His ancient grandfather came to bring him back to reality. It's not worth it, Lee, but for now, let's find another spot. Lee nodded silently and moved on. But in his heart, he knew that this was not over. He was not dumb. For a month, he had carved out a spot in the city for himself and for his family in that spot. He would not let it go so easily. They wanted to see you do good, but never better than themselves. The fight, part one. Oh, Sudan's falling apart. Cool. At least we saw a deficit. Could be a lot worse. But I think for this route, people want to go to reformers, so we'll probably go smoke out the rats. The Japanese will no longer be allowed to take our food and our people for their own sick needs. The Chinese people will gain true economic freedom, just not for our own coffers or for our safety, but for our nation. Immediate action will be taken out to curb Japanese influence and kick Zaibatsu's out. It will be worth a diplomatic backlash, for we must give everything to the Chinese people. You keep going for now. Nice. More technology is done. Great, great, great. Boom, 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 boom. Rubber. It's not that ahead of time now, so. And we can really use more extraction of that, so. We'll see. Let Jap Japanese finance collapse. And if they collapse, we can restore ourselves. The Siberian Revolutionary... Oh, who's this? Valsilovsky? Which I almost never see do that. That's pretty good. And Zykov. Oh, okay. And Kazakhstan. Cool. A decision. Ga Gao Wangzhu glanced at the disorderly group he had assembled. An assembly of economists, generals, advisors, businessmen, and cabinet members. They ranged from practical Nazis to Marxists and everybody in between. The only thing that kept them from literally being in each other's throats was Gao Zongwu, perhaps the only unifying factor in the nation. He assembled them for one reason, to try to find a solution to the crisis at hand. Right at this moment, there was a protesters outside the administrative street. Educated elite, fed up with Japanese subjugation, a decision must be made. A decision continued. Two main factions out of the group had seemed to emerge. One led by the reformist advisor and former government ta official, Tao Liang, that espouses a different a view of distancing Chinese economic reliance on Japan. Tao Liang and his colleagues state that distancing from Japan will let the Chinese economy grow locally, increase nationalistic 
a sentiment and let human and prevent human rights violations that the Japanese businessmen have committed. On the other hand, Chinese businessman Mai Tsai Ping, or Ping, along with his pro-Japanese allies, have assembled a plan pushing for continued corruption and covering up Japanese crimes. Criticizing Tiao's plan is dangerously unrealistic that could lead to sanctions or potentially worse, and that would be doom the Chinese economy. Mai is under fire for essentially sweeping Japanese crimes under the rug, however. It is undisputably true that Mai's option would luckily do well to repair the Chinese-Japanese relations and would probably recover the current situation. As the two groups bickered over the proper solution, trusted advisor and close friend of Gao Zong, uh, Gao Zhu Longjiang stood up and called for silence, calling for a balanced approach to the crisis. It was initially shouted down. Gao called for them to listen. Zhao elaborated on making concessions to both both sides, though not completely siding with each one. In the end, he said that it would mean that the best of both worlds, while avoiding the sanctions of the Chinese and the human abuses of those who were supporting it sweeping under the rug. Among the, the group, his view was highly unpopular, labeled entirely impossible, and a tightrope so thin it would cut her feet. Even Gao seemed to regard the plan as a pipe dream, but didn't dismiss it. After several hours of debating the merits of each choice, Gao caught for silence among the group, and instantly, a tense quiet fell over the dusty, unkempt conference room. I have made my decision, he said, as if letting the men and women on the on before giving a final answer. Uh, Fester? Smoke out the rats. I do want to smoke out the rats. I want, I want to see what we can do for this one. But of both worlds, even it may be difficult. Well, we might choose this path later when we get more content for China and TNO2. So, we'll see. But I do want to do smoke out the rats. <clears throat> Industrial independence. Across our nation, Chinese workers live and die in factories owned by the conglomeration of Japanese monopolies. The dreaded three diamonds of Mitsubishi are branded onto goods made in Chinese factories. The profits of said goods go directly to the pockets of Japanese businessmen, while their citizens cannot afford to feed the families. The corporate parasites will no longer leech off hard-working Chinese. We will incentivize Chinese prospecting businessmen while increasing regulations to force the Japanese out. The Fight Part 1 For weeks, the trio and Lee had been in undeclared war, and Lee could not help but feel that he was on the losing end. First, the son betrayed him. Y had claimed that he was going to run over to the market to buy lettuce and asked for money to buy with just like any other day, and Lee waited for him for hours through the hot midday. He sent out his watch to see what had become of him, but she returned empty-handed. Lee had no other choice but to close his stand early and send the entire family out to find the boy, the fear of finding nothing but a body growing every minute. And when, where had he been found? Behind some wall smoking with his friends, the money nowhere to be seen. And then just two days ago, Grandfather finally admitted that he needed rest, and that his wizened legs were pushing, being pushed too far. To all this, Lee had set his face as so and prepared to shoulder yet more weight, but today was different. Lee's wife came to him, her eyes full of tears as she had rarely seen before. Try as she made to wipe them away, they still came. What happened? Why are you crying? Lee hurried to her side, looking over for injuries, finding none. Between small gasps, the story came forth. I just wanted to talk with a lady. I told her I was pregnant, and she... What did she do? Lee's anger flowed as it never had before, and he had no doubt which women it was that had done this. She called me an ugly peasant whore and said China did not need any more children from me. Without another word, Lee left his stand and marched over to the tree, once again standing on his claim. He grabbed the woman and began to yell, the weeks of frustration pouring out of him given new sharpness by this attack on his very honor. It was not long before another member came to the commotion. You get away from her. Ji came at him, tearing the woman away and striking Lee across the face. There was no going back now. They both went at each other with violence, rolling around in the dust, bowling over pe pedestrians and frightened horses. Lee tore out a chunk of Ji's hair. Ji kicked him in the groin. Ouch. And we get another fight. Cool. And there goes Iman. Or Oman. Uh, actually, let's actually keep it on this. We want to not use this one. We use Juntan for this one if we are. Are we already using that? Oh, we can't change this at all. Okay, well, then whatever. We got a lot of compliance down here, which is pretty nice, actually. The fight part two. Ji was taller than him, so Lee kept to the ground, rolling two of them through the filth in the street. At length, Lee started to gain advantage when, while a human ring formed around the two, the quarrel quickly turned into a spectator sport. With a grunt of strength learned on the fields of China, Lee managed to buck Ji off of him and pin the man to the ground, pummeling his head. Gasping for air, Lee tightened the grip as Ji weakly squirmed beneath him. From when behind, he heard a cry, You dude! Lee turned around just in time for the short one to bash his face in with a metal plate. A woman screamed. Lee fell to the ground, stunned. He felt the blood gush from his mouth and saw his shattered teeth behind him. Another heavy blow to the spine sent Lee to his stomach, breathing in pain. But there, in front of him, he saw his wife, her hands covering her mouth and her eyes wide in fear. No, he would not fall to this. He rolled away and struggled to his feet in time to hear another sound. The sharp whistle of Beijing police and the shouts of men forcing their way through the ring. Lee, however, had only eyes for the man in front of him, forcing his body to keep moving through the pain. The short man swung once, twice, and caught Lee's fist and gut before a police made it to them. With a swift and precise crack, Lee found himself back on the ground as the police beat him with nightsticks, and as he and the other two were dragged away, he could see through the swollen eyes his nine-year-old son being held back by Wei, screaming for the police to give his father back. My sons, what will become of my sons? Jail. Okay, and then, Industrial Independence, and Cold the Diamonds. 
The idyllic town sat in the mountains, above the clouds and above the screaming gaps of humanity. There were no roads, but the traveler forged with his feet, and no worries but what was created of the mine. It was said that no man from outside the village had ever stepped in it, but it was mostly fable. Uh, all this changed with that when that cloaked man stepped in with his motorized bike and began making curious inquiries on the village's working men and of the quality of the rocks underneath. Unaware of the nature of man, each villager responded to the former commenting on the hardy nature of each man in the village. To the latter, all the man received was shrugs and questions on why someone would care about the rock underneath. And just as quickly as he left, he came. Or he came, he left. The man in the cloak was destined to return, but not under the same circumstances. When he returned, he returned with metal machines that consumed a shining black oil and forged roads in minutes. A dirt avenue was paved into the village, and workers from below, oil slipping into their hands, began to work. And work they did. The mornings in the village, when the grass was wet with dew and the rooster's crow, were replaced with the rumblings of machines underground, extracting a deeply black rock. The evenings, once a time for quiet reflection and hearty dinners, were replaced with rowdy makeshift bars that sprung up to support the workers' festering alcoholism. The afternoon, when farmers went to work and herders to herd, were replaced with back-breaking labor that choked the soul as well as the body. The village was modern, and the Japanese have done it. And then, businesses pull up. Destabilization, demand reform, and strikes of all damaged confidence in the Chinese economy. Due to our programs, we build a greater emphasis on Chinese business. The Zaibatsus can't support ventures into China anymore. Everything from factories to mines and even restaurants have withdrawn back to Japan. Good riddance, we say. A Chinese company will fill the space left by the Japanese, right? And investors pull out. For a fleeting moment, a calm descended over Nanjing. In the chaos of the aftermath, there was one moment in which everyone was considering their options. The calm was alive for this morning, the ugly head of the crash reared its head. The many Japanese investors involved in every pursuit from car insurance to military production nearly unanimously decided it was time to sell their ill-earned investments. The stock exchange, already teetering on the edge of total disaster, has collapsed in a resounding bang. Chinese investors, intimately involved with the affair of industry, pull out as well, putting money ahead of their allegiance to the state. The only ones demonstrating any loyalty to our unwavering courage in the face of the crisis are the people, and they must be rewarded for the patience. Gosh darn it. And what happens to the fight part three? Ah, so not too bad. There you go. Tear down a little bit more of the jail. Lee had lost track of a long time ago, or at least what he felt like. Felt long ago. No sun or moon would reach into a cell, only the light of a flickering bulb hanging from a dusty string and no clocks to measure the time. No comfort for the darn was to be found in the prison twice a day. He was led to a mess hall to eat food he could not chew, and every once in a while someone else would be thrown into the cell before being moved out. Lee did not know where he went, nor did he ask how long it has it been since I last spoke. There was little for Lee to do, other than nurse his wounded body and worry. Always worried like a tiger pacing around and around in its cage until it drops from exhaustion, unable to eat even if food were given to it. What of Young? What of his grandfather? Of grandfather, what would become of his stand? His wife had only seemed just settled, and the child inside her, no, could way survive? Would he abandon his family again in, in their time of need? The light bulb flickered and died, plunging Lee into a deeper darkness at even the rural night. Some guard swore loudly from down the hall, the power had gone out. Curling up on the bench, Lee once again straddled or cradled, his swollen jaw, despite himself, tongued at his newly missing teeth. No one was coming, and time stretched on. Minutes into hours, hours into days. Oh boy. We could, could do that. We could, yeah, we could maybe keep cutting that out. Wow, 2.3%. That's really bad. Oh boy. Oh man. And businesses pull out. Destabilization and demand for reform and strikes of all damaged confidence in the Chinese economy. Due to our programs to build a greater emphasis on Chinese business, the Zabatus can't support ventures into China anymore. I think I read this one, right? Yeah, I read this one. My bad. My bad. Get more stability, though. Incre decrease daily political power gain. Increase consumer goods factor. An interview with an old newsman. He's a man with graying hair standing about his newspaper stall. The sickly figure betrays his true age of 59. Each morning I wake up at 4 o'clock and do Tai Chi in the garden and it keeps me fit as I want. I eat fat pork, I don't diet, and I eat as many manto as I want. I won't be dying anytime soon, not that that it matters. Sure, I have a couple of friends, but ever since my wife passed, everything's gone so fast, it's a blur. Then, I go over to the newspaper stall and work here all the day. That's how it's been my whole life. The cigarettes are good, and the baiju take the edge, and each day I get a bed at my apartment. Things aren't fantastic, not with the Japanese at every corner, but it works for me, and what I can tell, it's all my Tai Chi friends. Better than before, back in Shantong, at least. Didn't have a great childhood, for sure. My mom was a local warlord's favorite whore. My dad came and gone before I was born. One time, when I was probably 15 or so, my mother left screaming in one of the warlord's guard's arms and never came back. After that point, I dropped out of the school out that I was struggling in and did everything I could find around the village. Drinks down by the brothel, do odd jobs for some cash, steal some food for the most part. This, as you can tell, is not heading down a great path. He laughs a bit anxiously, and then... Chinese letter forms? Yes. A modern nation is a free, and as long as Tokyo manipulates our reforms, we'll never be free. All this nonsense started over Japanese dominance in China. Why would we invite them to mold China into their image? They have failed us once again, but they will never do it again. We get more stability again, and a civilian factory. Increased daily political power gain, and decreased interest rates and consumer goods factories, which will be important. We could close up shop. I don't want to go down here first, just because it looks like it decreases interest rates, which is important, and get military factory, but an interview with an old newsman continued. Eventually, the kings I hung out with disappeared into the opium den at the new nearby town for hours on end. I knew the dangers of that poison. My mother loved it more than me, for that I used to hate her. After I took a pup, I pitied her. 
I'm telling you, kids, stay away from opium. Whatever they tell you, it'll kill you real quick. If it doesn't, you'll sure wish it did. Three of my closest friends murdered were murdered of it. By the end of the time of my den, it was a sack of bones. I was a sack of bones and skin, white as a cloud. The only thing that ever saved me was the army. Conscription started and I began fighting for Chiang. I don't mind too much politics, but that man was an idiot. Pulling cash out of the National Bank and giving it to friends and allies never did help much, but still ended up under the Japanese boot. Am I happy? Sure, I'm happy or as close as anyone can get. The government stabilized for the first time in history, and the economy is trying too, as well. My wife is dead, but I got friends and people and alcohol. If I died right now, I'd at least be a little content. But let's hope I don't die right now. Chongqing Arsenal? Um, also, is already done. We're actually really good on that stuff, but I guess we can do radar. He is a middle aged worker. <clears throat> the gunpowder seeps into his hand. He is the blacksmith of the forge, the one who has borne witness to countless tragedies and created them with his hammer. One of the arsenals I worked back in the day was in the papers, and not anything minor, mind you. The Japanese guy who leased the facility was using Chinese as slave labor. Little did I know, a good friend of mine and a co worker was getting no wages and being forced to sleep on a straw mat at an old building outside the arsenal. Apparently, I was a good enough worker that I got to go home every night and see my family. They weren't so lucky. One of those days at the Chongqing Arsenal was quite peculiar. I distinctly remember many of the men I usually saw working, who I would later learn were slaves, did not show, except for one. And he, in he came, smiling as if it was his last day before retirement. He walked into the leader's office as a Japanese man. Then he blew up. Must have been taking a grenade from the arsenal. For some godforsaken reason, the Japanese overseer survived, and he made sure his workers workers work harder than ever for less than ever. For years they toiled in that arsenal. Each day they returned more sickly and pale than ever. My naive, gosh darn head went thought they were just dieting. Dieting, you hear that? So many died in that arsenal. I'm sure you hear about this echoed again and again through your interviews, but the government wasn't hard enough. That businessman got to walk free, albeit exiled from China. Those families never got much of anything besides a meager pension, and deep in Chongqing arsenal that man's body so lay in ashes. No grave to mark a hero. And then corrupt businessmen leave. Corruptocrats have grown fat and content. Sitting on top of a pile of yen garnered by Chinese workers, it's time to wake them up. Our emphasis on native industry has caught the attention of the businessmen, begrudgingly. The monopolies are retreating back to the home islands or scattering across the sphere. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. And return to the light. Lee woke up to the clang of a baton on the early on the bars of his cage. You, you, time to go. Snap the old guard. Lee nodded and shuffled through his cell door. The guard escorted him through the jail up to the front gate, where he gave a nod to the gatekeeper and unshackled Lee's wrists. Right then, off you go. Lee blinked through the sun, squinting at the guard. What? The guard frowned. You're a mate, you're free to go. And with that, Lee was pushed out of the gate, with clothes, which closed behind him. He was free. In a day, as Lee wandered the sweltering streets lost in a section of Beijing he'd never seen before. At a length, he caught on, finding first a landmark, then a street which, which he knew. As the sun began to set, he made it, and stood face to face with his soul. Why don't you have a pork bun in your hand? You look like a man who could use some Jian Bing. There in front of him, with a hachimaki rope bound by, around his head, was his son Wai. He was working with a stall alone like a madman, baking, packaging, and selling all at once. He had rings around his eyes and swords on his wrist. His clothing was filthy, but there he was, and there was food on the stand, all safe. The trio was nowhere to be seen. Lee felt tears welling up in his eyes as he beheld his eldest son. As Lee walked up to the stand, Wai finally caught sight of him. Wai, Wai, or Wei stopped what he was doing as it struck, leaving the eggs to burn on the plate. The sight of his father, thin, bruised, and weakened, was a shock. What happened next was hardly less than shocky. Lee bowed. Thank you, Wei, for doing what I cannot. Wei shook his head. Stand up, Dad. I was the construction workers, not me. I only did what I had to. Wei told Lee of what happened while he was in jail. How he had told his friends who had told their fathers of what the trio had done to Lee and his mother. All of how they and the other workers started to boycott the trio stand no matter how low they set their prices. How grandfather had forced himself to work through the illness until he could no longer stand, and how his mother had grown heavier and heavier until she took too ill. How he had been left alone when he was, the trio packed up and left. All this and more came spilling out of the 14-year-old's mouth as he clung to his father. The nightmare was over and day had come. As the two embraced, Lee felt the worries of the past month fall from his back. The road had aligned against him and he had come out on the other end. It would not be easy, but he and his family survived and surely the worst had passed. For now, the first time in months, Lee did not think about the future. He was simply happy to be free. Welcome home. Ah, that's a nice story. Very nice story. But happy 1970s as well. We have hit a new decade and I'm Excited to see what new perils this decade has in store for us. Please, hopefully, not too many more crises. We can't deal with too many more crises in interview with an army man. We met him as he's off-duty, a reserve man. I'd say the largest loss following the reforms of the Nanjing Crisis was easy, easily, how easily, the military backslided. All the Japanese generals and theorists, one well, of the ones who had shaped entire sphere doctrines for decades, even before the war, uh, they were highly influential, uh, left. China was a hotspot of intellectual thought, including theoretical military thought and stopped as soon as all the royally educated military theorists left. The Chinese military was left on its own to forge its own path, and they turned to the ancients. The generals read Sun Tzu, Zhang Ziyo, Wei, Liao Zi, 
and all others of the classics for the first time since their childhood, with fresh adult eyes and anxious to revive Chinese military thought. So even if we lost a viable instead of the Japanese, we created a new breed of strategy, one that dominates the field and one that will dominate East Asia for years to come. The ancients offer more than dusty books and obsolete knowledge. Followed up, and so do jobs. And confidence is restored. Let's do that one. We have begun making leaps and bounds from the humble beginnings of the Gao administration. Thanks in large part to our modernization, we know a thing or two about building an economy from scratch. Our success has given us some wiggle room, and despite our shortcomings, international businesses have given us another chance. Because we are very, very educated here, right? That's gotta be right, right? Yeah. Why not? And get some better artillery, too, because we could use that. Um, that's a little, not looking very good for us, but whatever. It is what it is. Decrease consumer goods factors, increase GDP, that'd be nice. Followed up with an interview with an economist. Initially, we were concerned about this interview. We wanted to hear people's stories, not their opinion on how the crisis was a result of Chinese marketing affecting the stocks. We made sure to tell them this before the interview. Before the crash, I dabbled a bit in stocks per my profession, and Chinese stocks were booming before the crash. Really, truly, I had absolutely no foresight. Looking back now, it's obvious that the market was oversaturated. Companies that did nothing but sit there and occasionally yield some coal were becoming more some of the largest corporations in the sphere. A few karatsus went public. If you invest in them early enough, you are already crazy rich. I was living in a Nanjing penthouse. I had an American sports car that I managed to smuggle in. Parties all night during the weekends that were the talk of the town. Bad word. I had four homes scattered across the sphere. The strangest part is, I wasn't the only one. It seemed like a third of every urbanite in China had found a fortune and were saving it for as long as they could. In the days after the crash, the parties only got bigger and bigger. I was on vacation out west in Yunnan when the crisis hit. In a moment, everything was gone, and so do jobs. We all should have seen this coming. Mitsui had announced the closure of the Beijing branch. Yasuda is scaling back employees in Xianin, just as expected. The citizenry is reeling, but for this is the greater good of China. Once we purge the Japanese, we will fill the gaps with our own people. We will hold steady in the worst is yet to come. Our resolve to build a free China will overcome the hardship of unemployment and come out stronger because of it. But we will end our episode there. If you enjoyed this episode, I did because there was a lot of ups and downs, please leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow, as we might just be able to finish this campaign. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.